Welcome to Shop Talk Live, Fine Woodworking Magazine's bi-weekly podcast. I'm your host and Fine Woodworking Editor Tom McKenna, and with me this episode are Executive Art Director Mike Pekovich. Hey, guys. Web Producer Ben Strano. Hello. And Jeff Rose, uh, who will be manning the video works in the corner over there. Uh, Matt the Kenny is on a photo shoot on the West Coast, enjoying some uh, sunny weather in San Diego, so... He will not be here today. San Diego with his saw diver. Um, (laughs) Before we get started, I just wanted to remind folks that registration is open for Fine Woodworking Live 2017, which is set to take place April 21st to the 23rd at the Southbridge Hotel and Conference Center in Southbridge, Massachusetts. Take advantage of our extended early bird pricing. If you register before February 20th, you'll save 80 bucks. For details and to sign up, Go to finewoodworkinglive.com. Um, ben, do you want to talk about uh, the uh, the Hardwood Derby now? I guess it will be released by the time this show comes out. So, yeah, let's uh, – the Hardwood Derby. The Hardwood Derby. It's the first it's ever fir- yeah. Hardwood Derby. Um, and it's basically um, – a take, our take on the Pinewood Derby, the classic race, uh, wooden race car race uh, that uh, all the Cub Scouts do across the country. So uh, Matt was able to get us a track and um, basically folks are going to build their cars and bring them to race. Yeah. And uh, it's going to be held to 64 people. Okay. Uh, this way the math works. And we're not there all night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but you do not. So, so you need to buy a Pinewood Derby kit. Right. To get the wheels and the axles. Okay. But after that, the wood is all you. So you can use anything you want. There's no weight limit. <laughs> no way. <laughs> There's no weight limit. So, so if you want to use, you know, some crazy exotic hardwood that is heavier than any known substance, you, you are more than welcome, but you cannot add metallic weights. Well, here, here's a question that came up. I was on a podcast last night with um, the Modern Woodworkers Association. Um, and uh, I just got the theme song. And, he, <laughs> and Diami um, asked me whether he could use uh, like a laminate, like a, you know, a construction laminated beam. Oh, yeah, because <laughs> he's I, big on that. And I thought, wow, you know, sure. I didn't even think about that. Is that, you know, yeah, med- I mean, it's wood. It's, it's kind of wood, right? Yeah. Plywood, why if not? If it's some- sold as wood in a store. Yeah. I mean, you can't use like phenolic. And size constraints. There. You have to keep the wheel base with the same so it runs on the track. Yeah, and the exactly. Right. It's, yeah. it's got to be the exact same size as a Pinewood Derby car. Yeah. So, um, and we're working out some of the other details. You know, we're, we're, we plan to award uh, prizes for other topics, maybe, you know, um, funniest, you know, some sort of a theme that we'll come up with and, and see if we can get some fun prizes for, for folks who put extra effort into uh, trying to do something interesting. Slowest car for <laughs> Slowest. a car that was meant to go fast. <laughs> <laughs> my, uh, my son's Cub Scout uh, pack, they gave an award for fastest looking car. Oh, there you go. <laughs> so. <laughs> anyway, that's going to be uh, the, one of the Friday night events, and uh, we'll also be doing a live podcast uh, from Shop Talk from, Live Live from the uh, Final Drinking Live lobby or bar area. Hopefully, the bar area. Yeah, so. close to it at least. And spots are going pretty quick. Sounds like. Yeah, yeah, we're we're almost halfway sold out. So if you're uh, thinking about signing up, you we're may want to make the move and do it. We're we're, we're more than halfway yeah. sold out. You think so? Oh yeah. Aren't we? Yes. Well, yeah. not way more. Not way more. But we're pushing. We'll, we will push our max. I'm yeah. sure. So, and don't forget also to uh, get your hotel reservation. If you have signed up and have not made your reservation, the hotel um, is filling up fast as well. So be sure to to book your spot. This way, you can park your car and not have to go anywhere else. It's uh, it's gonna be a great uh, a great time. Yep. So let's get to the questions. This first one is from John. And John says, how do you deal with glue squeeze out in an open poured wood like oak? If you let the glue dry, it seems like it dries inside the pores. If you try to clean it out while it's wet, it's quite hard to avoid just smearing it into the pores. A toothbrush seems to do an okay job, but do you have any better ideas? We do work with a lot of oak, Mike. How about yeah. Um, I don't know if the, that the pores specifically present a bigger challenge than any other wood. Um you know, step one is minimize the amount of squeeze out as much yeah. as you can. 
Um, I think that is the one curse of Norm Abram was just the amount of glue <laughs> he used on his projects. Um, so first thing is get strategic about your glue-ups. Try to limit that amount as much as you can. Um, a lot of work that I do because it does have um, through tenons and dovetails that stick out where I don't want to be surfacing after um, I'm gluing up, I will pre-finish and that will solve that problem. Whether if you, uh, you know, a light co coat of whatever finish you're, you're doing, that's always a good idea anyway, just because it makes finishing a little bit easier to begin with. And then uh, some different strategies for when you do have squeeze out. A lot of times, unless you are just really sloppy applying the glue, a lot of the squeeze out is just sort of, it can be, turns into like a little bead yeah. along, you know, that the joint itself. And if that's the case, I tend to let it harden at least until it's rubbery. I don't mm -hmm. want it to hit it when it's wet because you will smear things out. And uh, I'll just get a chisel and sort of go in toward the corner of the joint and try to lift that bead off um, when you can. The only caveat there is a lot of times if you're sort of chiseling, you know, into the corner, a lot of times you're going cross grain. Yeah. And if your chisel is a little bit dull, meaning it's got just a little wire edge on the back, you'll sort of get those cross grain scratches, scratches. Mm. which are far worse than, and that will really show up in the finish too. Yeah. So make sure your chisel is really smoothly sharp. Yeah. Scratches and, are harder to remove than that, the dark yeah, glue. Exactly. That's for sure. So, yeah. So you're, you're kind of like, creating different problems in trying to solve your glue problem. But well, I, I, I work, I don't work with as much white oak as you do. And I, um, just the case that I'm building, uh, the cabinet portion is white oak and I used blue tape. It was a biscuit jointed, uh, blue carcass. Tape. What is this? Blue I'm about tape? to use blue tape, um, at the corner joint. So I dry oh, yeah. fitted it and then put tape down. So, um, cause I was thinking the same thing about, you know, not having a whole lot of experience with white oak, I was worried that, boy, you know, I'm going to have a lot of corners. So yeah. I want to try to get all that glue out of there before uh, before it dries. And it, and it worked okay. I had a couple spots where I had to go back um, and I used some of Tim Russo's, you know, tricks for dealing with squeeze out from a recent uh, issue. So yep. and, uh, Another thing is you might want to change your glue. I know this may or may come up later, um, but... Uh, Bob Van Dyke at Connecticut Valley School of Woodworking, he likes to use high glue. And one of the reasons he likes it is because it cleans up really easy. And I think he just uses like a toothbrush and water. And that doesn't affect the finish in the same way that a PVA glue hmm. will. No, it, it doesn't repel finish the way yeah. PVA glue does. But um, uh, speaking of Bob Van Dyke, though, his method for nixing squeeze out before it happens, where as you're assembling the joint, Right before you drive it home, you look in the joint and you see that little bead of glue that is pooling up at the at the base of, of a joint. So specific, like a mortise and tenon joint yeah. as you're seating the tenon. And take yeah. a clean glue brush and wipe that away before. And I've done that and you wind up with no squeeze out coming out of that joint. And um, But you're just, you're just pulling away that very last bit of glue before it squeezes right. out. Um, has anyone ever used, I remember reading this in the magazine a long time ago, uh, uh, it's an article by Michael Fortune about using waxy lit. Mm -hmm. has, yeah. I've never used it, but can you still, wasn't an issue with that article that waxy lit was no longer available? Well, and or, I think, I think uh, Lee Valley picked it up shortly okay. thereafter. So you can buy it from Lee Valley. That was a pretty cool uh, article and, t and, you know, tips on it. There, there are a ton of different ways to, to deal with, with squeeze out. And I think the primary thing that Mike mentioned before was really limiting, you know, like being careful in the amount of glue. And also, you know, when I put a mortise and tenon together, I'm aware of the, the forces. And so I don't necessarily glue up the entire tenon. I, I'll put more glue on the tip, knowing that as I drive right. it in, the glue is going to spread up the tenon and, and um, you know, hopefully seat without coming out. Right. So. Yeah, yeah. And a regular mortise and tenon. Most of the glue for me goes in the mortise, so it gets squished yep. down. But if it's a through mortise and tenon, all the glue goes on the tenon itself, so it gets squeezed toward the shoulder because I really want to keep the that end mm -hmm. grain joint nice and clean. And then to your point, either I I don't normally practice the finesse of Bob Van Dyke and get that last little squeeze out before <laughs> it seats home. But if the I do, finesse of Bob Van Dyke. if I do have any, it's it's at the shoulder. I've pre finished my parts, and the stuff pops up anyway. Yeah. 
Um, so, but the waxy lit stuff, it's one of those things that sounds... It doesn't look like it's available really, anymore, just really, to save anyone. Well, that's good. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's like really clean in concept. You just put the stuff down, so when you glue it together, you pop the glue off. But then Michael, who's a very exacting person, so I'm sure it's not as difficult as he makes it sound, but he goes into great detail about then removing <laughs> the waxy lit from the surface so it doesn't, doesn't mess up your it's finish. <laughs> and it's like... In all that time, I could have just gotten rid of the squeeze out. So. <laughs> or, or pre-finished. So for me, yeah. pre-finishing does the exact same thing. Um, pre-finishing, I've just started really pre-finishing. All right. And that table, I, I just finished. It was as I was assembling everything, you know, I would I'd put a, a coat of finish on and then move on to the next part and then assemble. Um, it, wow, that makes everything so much easier. <laughs> Because especially the it was a trestle table and that base is just impossible. You know, there's a lot of nooks and crannies, yeah. a lot of areas that I'm not going to be able to get into anywhere near as easily as as when the parts are apart. Right. Wow. All time know. favorite technique right there. There you go. <laughs> so, Mike, when you when you have your through dovetails, how do you uh, avoid squeeze out? I'm I'm not through on the proud dovetails rather. Um, for any time I'm doing dovetail joint, all the glue goes just on the pin walls. Right. Um, the only structural portion of the dovetail is the, the intersection of the pins and tails along the sidewalls. Everything else is just end grain, so don't worry about it. So don't go slathering glue all over, like down on the, the bases, yeah. you know, the end grain bases of the dovetails, because all you're going to get is squeeze out. So just a little bit, only on the pin walls, so everything gets shoved toward the shoulder of the joint instead of get squished out. Yeah, and tight joinery, you're going to yeah. be real solid there. And and you could pre-finish the faces of a dovetail joint. Yes. And because there's no glue going on either one of them. That's true. Yeah. Um, and then especially like on like a drawer glue up where the dovetails aren't proud and they are going to get flushed later, you can still pre-finish the inside face of those parts. So as I'm directing the glue down, if I do get any squeeze out on that inside corner again, it's going to pop up. Yeah. Or do Tom's little tape trick on that inside yeah. corner too. Well, I don't know if they're mine. <laughs> There's a lot of blue tape flying around this place uh, <laughs> the past couple of years. Um, let's move to question number two. This one is from David. And David writes, I'm in the process of designing my workbench. I have two cast iron vintage record vices, a large 52 and a half, which has an 11 inch opening. Then he wants to use that for the face vise. And he has a 52D model with an eight inch opening, which he says he was thinking of using for the end vise. Um, he writes, I would make the usual row of bench dog holes to utilize this vise. I've worked on benches with the European style wooden tail vices and was always compensating for the sag that developed in these vices over time. Do you think a record cast iron vise would be a good alternative and possibly more stable and less prone to sag? Um, funny you should ask that question. I, uh, my tail vise on my primary bench is a record cast iron vise. And you have the smaller vice, which is good. My vice is, is, has a wider jaw, so the only problem on mine with the wider jaw is the little uh, bench dog, that up and down thing on the vice itself is ends up being inset from the front edge of your workbench oh, more than gosh. I'd like, so my dog holes aren't as close to the front edge as I would like. And then Ben said, well, why don't you put a wooden jaw and drill a hole in it and then just have your bench dog offset toward the front. And it's like, I can't because I already drilled all those <laughs> bench dog holes <laughs> in towards the bench. So not you a bad look idea. You fairly torn when I so, said that. <laughs> um, no, so you won't have the sagging. You don't sort of burn that whole, you know, right-hand front corner of a bench if you have your typical tail vise there. So that's a good thing. Um, it's not a perfect solution because as you open that vise jaw wider, um, just that gap there it becomes a little bit cumbersome having your workpiece sort of hanging off the end of the bench a little bit. It's not as nice as a really nice, you know, L-shaped tail vise right. in good condition, but it's better than one that sags. Mm -hmm. so, which they will. Which they will. So, And the bottom line is I use, as um, we've stated often, um, both Matt and I end up using our tail vices really infrequently. I don't know if yeah. Matt even has one on his bench. I don't know if he does. I don't have one. I mean, I don't have a, a high-end style bench, but I just have a, a face vise and some dog holes and... I yeah. clamp all sorts of stops down when I'm when I'm planing. So yeah, there was um, 
Jeff and I were editing uh, the video workshop that's about to come out with Matt Wada, and I didn't even notice it when we were shooting, but... Uh, let, let he, me, let, I'm sorry, let me just interject. Matt Wada is an instructor at uh, North Bennett Street School. Yeah. So. Yep, and uh, we were doing the uh, North Bennett Street School <clears throat> toolbox, the famed toolbox. Um, and there was one little trick that we didn't pick up while we were there, and all of a sudden Jeff goes, look at that. And I'm this... Matt is like one of these guys who like just oozes tips and techniques. Sure. You know, right. it's like just being around him. I learned so, so much. But he, whenever he went to the tail vice, had a little block that was probably two inches in one direction, three inches in the other direction. So he never opened the tail vice more than one inch because he would open up the tail vice, stick this block in, close it. If, it, if, it, if the piece that he was that he was uh, clamping down was shorter, he just turned that block around okay, and that would fill in the extra gap. It was, it was the most ingenious little simple block that, I mean, you know, everyone's got them lying around, but it made the idea of using a tail vice so much easier to me because mm. that's one thing I hate about it is I'm constantly in the shop sitting there, right. you know, opening right. up five inches Whereas if you just had this block sitting around and it would work with with a with a regular old face vice on the on the end, um, you would never open your vice more than an inch or two to oh. clamp anything down. Sounds like a workshop tip. Yeah. Did you did you take video of it? Do you have we video have of it? video of it. We don't have him talking about. It. I'm going up to Boston to get some more stuff mm. with him soon though. So sounds like a pretty good cool idea. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was a little inside. It was good. Awesome. All right, but well, let's move on. I think we're done with that, right? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> let's get to our first segment. It's time for our all-time favorite articles of all time for this week. Uh, ben, since you're to my right, do you want to go first? All right. This is random. <laughs> um, I actually... the My original all-time favorite article of all time for this week was going to be uh, Tim Rousseau's Float the Top. And it wasn't necessarily the article, because I don't think I've read the article. Is that that little uh, kind hall, of entry hall table? table. Hall Asia, table. Yeah, yeah, his Asian-inspired hall table. Yeah. Um, the video workshop was massive for me. I watched that video workshop a couple times um, back in the day. And I, up until this point, I had never seen a top that was floated like that. I'm sure tons of people have done that. It just It was the first time that I had seen it. But as I was thumbing through the article, or the, through the issue... I came across Dan Fea's Why You Need a Router Plane. And the Why You Need a Router Plane of this article isn't necessarily the monumental aspect of it for me. It was setting up and sharpening a router plane, oh. which is a pain in the saw. The saw. <laughs> <laughs> it's an ode to Matt Kenny. <laughs> but, um, and this was another thing that Matt Matt Wada reminded me of up in Boston. He pulled out his his router plane, and he was doing a lot of work with it. And I had bought a router plane a long time ago, and I didn't have much success with it at all. And it was because it was poorly set up. Mm -hmm. And he said, "Oh, you got to check out Dan, who's also an instructor at North Pennant Street School. He's the the, cat, the cat lead. Uh, yeah. He's the head instructor of yeah. the cabinet making and furniture making program." But he, he mentioned this article, and I remembered reading this when it came out, and it was that, like, I pinned it up on the wall, and I have to do this, and now it's just a reminder of what I really have to do. Because a router plane is incredibly useful for a lot of tasks in the shop, and um, but only if it's functioning properly, and I don't want to go out and buy a new one. I got one off Craigslist for 50 bucks, and... Well, That's Dan, one, I want to work. one of the things that I've worked with Dan a few times over the years, and I, one of the great things about working with um, these fabulous woodworkers who are also instructors is that they really can explain things really well. And I did um, one article. It was the, uh, his journey on a bomb building a Bombay chest. Right. And he did an amazing job, like describing to me before he did things what was happening. But he also did another article on on. Uh, a bracket foot, 
making a bracket foot. And there was a whole section that we, we Mike and I were trying to cram into the article, and it, it was basically on drawing, laying out the, the whole foot. And Mike had this brilliant idea, well, why don't we just bust it out and go for it? And we did. And his drawing methods were, were amazing. And just seeing him kind of... Or, or the way Dan works and how he, he teaches people was really crystal clear. And that article turned out to be one of the most popular, I think it was a masterclass. So it was one of the most popular masterclasses right. we, we had done. And he also did another article on that was similar to this one, to the router, router plane, um, on sharpening gouges where he laid yes. out the yeah. step by by step process of you know sharpening that curve and it was just you know I know we had a lot of help with the illustration but you don't get those illustrations without Someone good instruction yeah. from yeah. from the author yeah yeah his article on laying out the cabriole not the cabriole the uh, bracket foot yeah. sort of the uh, OG bracket foot was really really great because it was a great combination of explaining the underlying geometry to this shape but he wasn't relying just on the geometry, like draw it like this and it'll be perfect because right. Saturn has the same number of rings <laughs> as the pyramids in Egypt. So it's just, but no, here's a geometric underpinning for this and how to draw it, which is really cool. But then he had some really good real world advice in that a lot of times you draw something that looks good on a plan view, mm -hmm. but in three dimensions, it can get wacky yes. and the bracket foot is one of those things because you're cutting a curve in two faces and that as you look at that from um, from an angle, uh, they really exaggerate. So he shows how you draw out a curve, which is if you draw it out exactly the way you like it on a plan view, by the time you cut it, it's way too curving. It looks really stupid. So mm -hmm. he talks about don't do that. Draw it out more subtle than you think you want it to be. By the time you see it in three dimensions, boom, it's just right. And that's one of those you know, key design tips, which apply to like every single thing you do and you make. Yeah. Them. It's funny because I forgot about that aspect of the article. And, and it's one of the things that as you, as people start to design furniture, you can't just think, you know, straight on, you have to take a walk around it on both sides. And sometimes even in the back, because I think I learned from that article how changing, you know, moving three or four steps in one direction or the other changes a shape drastically. And so you have to consider all those angles. Right. Very cool. Good stuff. Yeah. Dan Fayo. So that's sort of like you agree to meet someone at a party and then you get there and decide you want to hang out with someone else. Yep. So that's kind of a burning well, Tim there. And this, <laughs> <laughs> this this issue was is is <laughs> pretty pretty deep because it's got another one of my favorite articles, which is um, John's JT. working with reclaimed yeah, lumber, right? Which well, is pretty. Did you use on too. your um, on your recent cabinet on stand? Didn't you use a, a similar method that Tim Rousseau used on his floater table with a a, str a rail that runs front to back that's yeah. a little bit higher up and yeah, with just the fix it up, gives yeah. it that little reveal. Good stuff. How about your uh, all time favorite? Mike? Um, this comes from issue 165. It's an article by Chris Bexford. I brought this just for you um, on uh, how to deal with wood movement in furniture. So it's one of those things where, I mean, one of the biggest challenges in furniture making is the fact that we deal with a material which is going to move sort of in along one axis through the seasons as the humidity changes. So a lot of what we do is engineering a piece to have um, components running in the same direction so everything is moving. And then the second thing we do is when we can't do that and we have pieces coming in at, at different grain orientations, how do we accommodate that movement across that joint? And that's kind of that's kind of the nut of furniture design yeah. overall. And Chris, he covers everything from, you know, blanket chest to tabletops to breadboard ends to mortise and tenon joinery all different ways and in examining different problems of wood movement, um, it really becomes a great treatise on building sound furniture, which isn't going to blow up and it's going to last for um, right. a long time. And even though he builds kind of in the shaker style, it applies to every single piece in any style that someone would make. Mm -hmm. It's just one of those articles where if you did nothing and don't do this, but if you only read that article and no other article or issue put out by any other magazine, 
That's probably enough to keep you it's, going. It's the for, one we're about to release. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it's one of those ones that that will. Re, it's kind of that textbook that will really keep you going for a really long time. Right. I can't the, tell you how many times I see people absolutely disregard wood movement on go. Instagram and other places, and it just makes me go bonkers because it's like bonk, bonk, bonk. <laughs> bonk, bonk, bonk. <laughs> it's that piece looks phenomenal right now. Yeah. yeah. And in six months, it's going to explode or it's going <laughs> to crack. And it's like you can do something about that. You just have to know a few rules. And learning those rules is just, I mean, that's that's the the most basic of the fundamentals that you really have to you have yeah. to listen to. Well, in their defense, uh, originally living in Southern California near the coast, there's no heating season and there's no air conditioning season. And the average humidity probably doesn't vary more than a one percentage point at any given time. So, and that's where I learned how to build furniture. And you, you heard about wood movement theory. <laughs> it's like, yeah. Okay. Surf's up. Yeah. No, that's just, those people are like way too, they're wound a little they're too tight. Too it's always those East Coast guys who are like, rip, rip, leave an eighth inch gap in your drawers. It's like, yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, the darn Yankees. So, and I never, because I never had a problem with wood movement. It's all good. So I moved to Connecticut and... September and when the heat came on, late November, December, every now and then I would hear a ping, click, ping, coming from various <laughs> pieces of furniture around the house. And um, it became quite evident at that point that, yes, a wood movement is a real thing and not just a theory. And I'd sort of, you know, relearn the craft at that point, starting with Shaker Furniture. Okay, let me learn how to build furniture with this whole concept in mind. And obviously some I've kept in mind ever since then. Yeah, I I have um, a very strange piece. It was built when uh, back in like the mid '90s, and I I, w I needed a coffee table for our apartment, and I took a woodworking class at a, a local high school. You know, they had evening, you know, once or twice a week, you get to come in and build basically whatever you want. But the machinery wasn't great. It wasn't kept up, but it was good enough for me to get this pine table together and had a, uh, I think it was a, a really thick top, almost seven, eight in inches thick. And um, the top warped on me. And I, I was like, I just have to get this thing done. I was trying to get it down. It wouldn't sit flat. So in a moment of frustration, I drilled holes through the top into the post, into the legs, and I screwed that sucker down and I, <laughs> I painted it. <laughs> And I tell you, the thing has not cracked. It's been more than 20 years, and it hasn't cracked. It's amazing. And I think it's got to have something to do with the paint. I mean, I, it, I glommed it's a pine on. top? Yeah. Okay. So that might probably have something to do with it as but well. It, but it's just so funny, I, you know, hearing about all the wooden movement stories, and I'm like, well, I got, I got screws in that bad boy. <laughs> <laughs> has it moved? And it's got to be the paint. I mean, I think that's part of it. And the fact that maybe it hasn't moved and, you know, it's never moved out of its environment. It could be something Maybe as so. well, but I don't know. It's, it's a mystery. But I was just at my parents' house, and one of their doors, it's a frame and panel door, and my dad painted it this summer. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, hey, Pops, you see that gap right there? He's like, yeah, I don't know why that happened. Oh, was, you know, so I was like, yeah, moved. <laughs> yeah, why don't you get some paint and fill that in, and it won't be a problem next year. Right. <laughs> so. right. Well, um, I have... Not an article uh -oh. necessarily, but recently a former editor, Scott Gibson, sent me a package. And oh, in it, there was a note and it says, Tom, I'm cleaning out some old things and came across this. I thought you should have it. Paul Roman gave it to me in 1994. Even then, I understood these were rare. And what it is, is issue number one. And it's all of its glory with the wrap on it. Wow. And it's it's amazing because, you know, I barely want to open it because you can still feel it that there's – take a look at that. If you feel it, there's still resistance to the bind. Mm -hmm. And so it's it's in like pristine condition. Yes. It's It just arrived in my mail. And so I just took the time this morning to kind of go through it again. And it's so funny – the topics that we covered and just looking at some of the titles, there was one article um, by Helene, Helena Fendelman, and it's just called Tramp Art. 
<laughs> and I'm thinking, boy, that wouldn't run today, would it? <laughs> well, tramp art's a, a it's like a folk a, art, yeah. yeah. But it's just funny the 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 terminology and what they covered back then and what we do now, it's very different. And one of my they had three contributing editors, Tayfred, Robert Sutter, Sutter, and they had a gentleman named Alistair A. Stair. Alistair A. a Stair. Stair. And he wrote an article in this issue on library ladders, which are basically stairs. Isn't that odd? <laughs> <laughs> but I lo- what I loved, there were a couple of things that I, I just wanted to, to point out. And, and one was the first letter. Um, it was basically from the editors and talking about trying to get people to write for the magazine. And he, uh, I guess I, I'm assuming it was Paul Roman, but. Uh, he says, Lassie, let us, we hope you let us know when you hear of any, something your fellow woodworkers might be interested in. We're always open for article ideas and indeed articles themselves because we're relying almost entirely on you, our readers, for them. Naturally, we pay for the articles we use. What we're looking for primarily is expertise. The writing usually has a way of working itself out. I just love that line. That's really and good. it's so true <laughs> today, you know, because um, if we have new authors, we have a lot of experienced authors that we use, but when we have a first timer that a lot of the, the, the response is, well, I'm not a writer. I don't do this. And it's like, well, you don't have to be a writer. We can, we just want to hear your story and watch you build this piece. And then we'll try to help you uh, express it in print and in video. Um, but there was also another article that we had run this past year in our anniversary, one of our anniversary issues, and it was from Tay Frid. And Tay Frid talking about design is just, just very interesting. He has some very strong opinions, and it was one of my um, favorite articles. Um, I think he had a great line in here that says, I do not think that all furniture designers should be craftsmen first, but I certainly am convinced that the designer should know the material in which he is going to design. And I think that sort of goes back to so sure. kind of wood movement, yeah. which is a continuing theme. Yeah. And, I'll you know, actually, I'll, I'll post that issue Okay, uh, in the show notes. Yeah, yeah. and our, our Bruce Hoadley is in here. I mean, it's a... It's just a treasure trove of, of ideas, and, and it's just funny seeing the evolution of the magazine from then to now. And I know we've gone... For with our subscribers, with the kind of the retro cover, um, it's just all coming together, and this is just a fabulous uh, present to get in the mail. I thank these, Scott for thinking of me. These library ladders are intense. Aren't they amazing? <laughs> it's crazy. Wow. Oh, Matt wanted to partake in this bit too, so he had sent me a note. He said basically, um, any article by Mike Pekovich, he really couldn't think of one he liked more than the other. So he just said sort of as a group. The, the latest is the favorite? Anything by Mike is great. So I just, thanks, Matt. I just wanted to throw that out there for everybody. Hey, before we move on, uh, there, there's a great uh, sculpture of Jim Thorpe, too. Oh. So. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> Thank you, Matt. <laughs> Matt okay. and I pre-planned his absence a little bit. Well, he's surfing <laughs> right now, right? Um, San Diego. All right. Well, let's get back to the questions. This one comes from Connor. And Connor writes, I recently decided to replace my father's carpenter grade Stanley number no. 4. I bought a Veritas low-angle smoother with versatility in mind. But I have a few questions. Is this technically a bench plane or a block plane? What's the difference between the two? And he also says, I bought the plane with a 25-degree iron, so it cuts at 37 degrees. That is a, it's a bevel up with a 12-degree bed. Um, is this okay for light face shavings, or should I buy an iron <coughs> Excuse me, with another angle for that use? Well, it is a bench plane. Mm-hmm. True. So, which is, I, I would say, because of its size. And a bench plane is, yeah, it's a bench plane. Um it's like a block plane in that the, the blade is bedded with the bevel up and there's no chip breaker. And um, that kind of speaks to the versatility, which right now with the sort of standard angle grind on the blade, it creates a low angle cut. And I think that's really good for end grain, maybe softer woods, but basically for general planing, you probably want to get up to about 45 degrees or so. Um, so rather than honing the blade, if you want to get an extra blade and hone it at uh, 45 degrees minus 12 yeah. degrees, which is helping me out, Ben, um, 32. do that. <laughs> and then you have a standard plane. And then um, 
for like for final smoothing, especially on really tricky wood, sometimes you want to go at a steeper angle than that. So get another blade and kick it up to where you're planing it, maybe 50 or even 55 degrees. Um, and that kind of does it. I think in, in concept, it's really cool. Um, I don't know how many people do this as a regular practice, meaning you've got one plane, I've got three different blades, and I'm changing those guys out. Yeah, I don't know. G getting it set up every time is going to get old pretty quick. No. And I, like, I've, I've had the same thought, especially back in the day where it was hard to justify an expense like one hand plane, let alone right. three hand planes. And um, because they're, any good tool is expensive. Yes. So, you know, I thought, well, I'll get the bevel up smoother and I'll get blades, I'll get this in. And now I'm kind of glad I didn't go that route. It would absolutely work. But there is something to be said. I need to, I need to break out a smoother. Do it. It's set up from the last time. It's still sharp. It's good, it's good to go. Yeah. Um, I don't think that you would be as likely to use the plane the blade that you should be using in in a given moment because you're just going to go well I don't want to pull out this blade and set it up and get it aligned and set the depth and do all this you know right there's just there's a lot of work that goes into getting a plane running the way it's supposed yeah. to for a given task well Bexford wrote an article for us a few years back on, yeah, on just it, this topic. But he has a lot of hand plans. I know he does. <laughs> <laughs> so Chris, how can you change? Well, okay, this is actually not a bad, it's not a bad place to start because um, it's really practical. You can do yeah. a lot of work and it just might not be as maybe as efficient as you would like, but... Um, What's the cost of a, a replacement blade for that model? Do you know? If, it's if, like 50 bucks, I think. Yeah. yeah, yeah so, it's, I think, it, like, well, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, of those three angles, low, medium, and high, you're going to be using probably the medium, the 45-degree angle for the majority of your work. So you're probably going to keep that in there for the most part. But then what you can always do is the second plane for me would probably be either a jack plane, standard jack plane, or another smoothing plane, number four, that's bedded at 45 degrees. Yeah. So that's great. That becomes your 45-degree plane down the road. Take this... Um, bevel up smoother and probably keep the low angle blade in there probably 90% of the time because you can use it for uh, planing end grain for shooting the ends of parts. You'll use it all the time for that. And then keep that blade ground at a really steep angle. Just keep that, put it in your drawer or in your um, workbench or something and just pull it out when your 45 degree plane is, in, is still getting a little tear out. Right. So then you have basically, it's kind of like a dual special use plane for mm -hmm. your bevel up. And then you've got your everyday plane at 45 right. degrees. That's one a thing, really good combination. One yeah. thing I did edit out, and it, it probably comes into play here, what Mike was saying, is that Connor had mentioned in his letter that he had just received, I think it was for Christmas, um, a Lee Nielsen uh, block plane. I think it was the 102, if I'm not mistaken. Um and was very happy with it. So he could use cool. that for, you know, some of the end grain shaving, you know, end grain work, um, chamfering, kind of some of the lighter duty things. Those things are, are awesome with one handed use and, sure. you know, and then go in Mike's direction. It's a good way to start with uh, switching out blades. But just know that you will <clears throat> wind up buying more hand planes. Oh, yeah. And oh, that's, yeah. that's you, not yeah. a bad thing. As you get yeah. into it, yeah, it's a good way. And it's a really good way to experiment because you'll probably. You know, it's a good way to get repetition and setting up that hand plane, that's for sure. Yeah. But so, if the versatility is a better sell to the significant other, by oh, all sure. means, go right ahead yeah. and, and use that card. Yes. And it isn't like, well, I'm spending extra on these blades. Once I get other hand planes, I'm not going to use them. It's like, no, nah, you'll use at least It'll, two. Yeah. yeah. Um, for me, my go-to planes are... You know, the standard angle, so it'd be like a four and a five, but I use those interchangeably. I do have a low angle uh, Veritas smoother that I use primarily as my shooting board plane at, at a low angle. And then I have a uh, Lee Nielsen four and a half with a 55 degree frog for the really gnarly stuff. And of the three planes, the 45 degree planes get used the vast majority of the time. The next most used is a low angle plane for shooting parts and end grain and the least used plane, but it's still really important to have is that high angle plane for when you need it. So, 
uh, Veritas sells pre-ground 38 degree and 50 degree. So wow. equivalent of a 50 degree and a 62 degree frog. Which would you go with? Um, neither because you can hone any blade to any angle as long as the honing angle is steeper than the grind angle. Yeah, but he's he's going to be buying an, an extra blade. Yeah, get a, get a, the standard angle grind and just hone and it at a steeper it. angle because yeah. if you want to go back to a shallower angle, you can just grind off that little hone part. Whereas if you buy a blade which is ground really uh. steep, you're never going to be able to, unless you want to take three hours to grind that back to a 25-degree bevel, if you ever want to go to a lower angle, you're kind of stuck. That's deep. There's really no benefit to That's starting deep. with a higher grind. That's really, really, okay. That's a good tip. All right. Mike's work is done here. Mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> let's, let's move on to uh, question number four. This one is from Brandon. I've been thinking of making and selling small items like cutting boards and pizza peels. I don't know what that is. Due to the ease of shipping. What, a pizza peel? What's a pizza peel? Yeah. Oh, pulling pizzas in the, the oven. Oh, Holy okay. Cow. Okay, I didn't know that's what that was called. Um, pizza peel. However, <laughs> I'm really interested in making and selling dining tables, desks, and smaller end tables. I know some, if not all of you guys, build and sell your furniture. I'm curious as to how you ship big pieces. You're from New York, man. You're supposed to know a pizza peel. I didn't work in. I worked in a bakery. I didn't work in a pizza place. Uh, you're from California. It's okay. I have two pizza peels. <laughs> I don't have any. I don't think I do. In fact, I my first pizza peel. I just bought whatever from a cooking supply store, and the blunt. The tip was a little too blunt. I actually sharpened my pizza peel to really slide underneath the the <laughs> pizza. What there. angle? <laughs> it's pretty shallow. Do I'm you have a high angle and a low angle pizza peel <laughs> for Sicilian versus, you know, so. flatbread? <laughs> anyway, um, um, I, I don't, I've never sold a piece or shipped a piece, so I, don't, I can't uh, answer this one at all. Um, yeah, little stuff is easy. You just box it up, take it to UPS, you know, boxes, wall cabinets, anything like that. Anything bigger than fitting in a box, um, without getting too big, I'll just make a crate, which are actually are really fun and easy to do. I just get some quarter inch Luan plywood from Home Depot, some one by two stock, and you sort of, you know, cut out a square, tack the stock around the edges to create a border, do that to all your sides. And then you can like screw everything together mm-hmm. by rigid foam, rigid foam insulation, you know, um, spray mount the glue to the glue to the inside faces of that. Anyway. My shipping crates are really clean. In fact, my local UPS um, woman, she loves my crates. She goes, that's a really nice crate. What's in there? I said, a piece of furniture. Well, I hope your furniture is as nice as your crate. So. <laughs> now, do you, um, you know, some pallets come with a pre-excavated uh, slot or two for uh, forklift blades. Big do stuff. you do that? I have on, I did ship a big dining table and that's you basically, you do create a pallet, you know, in essence, um, to, with the skids on it to get a, a pallet jack or forklift underneath it. That was the only time I shipped something really big and I found sort of a, actually I shipped it out of, through the company because we have a lot of shipments coming in and out. And, um, that becomes a bit of a hassle because, there are issues about, okay, just getting it either to this place or picked up, but then it's also getting it to the client. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And they're going to have to, like, get a crowbar and bust open a giant crate in order to get this piece of Which furniture out. Some people out. would find yeah. that really exciting. Some do, some don't. <laughs> it's fragile. So, it's so fragile. It's French. <laughs> for bigger stuff now, um, I tend to have it, um, I think it's called, like, blanket-wrapped shipping, where there are shipping shipping companies which will pull up a van or a truck to you. They'll come into the house. They will wrap the piece of furniture for you. They're wearing like the white gloves and all this kind of stuff. They're, it's like yeah. a crime scene. Like in the and movies. And they will move it. <laughs> um, they will bring it into the client's house. They will unwrap it and say, where would you like this? And they'll put that exactly where they want it. To me, that is the ultimate in shipping. Obviously, it's the most expensive way to go about doing that. I did ship a desk that way from Connecticut to Boise, Idaho, and I believe the shipping on that was like $700. Wow. 
So depending on what you're charging for the piece of furniture, that's either more than you want to pay or that's acceptable because of the quality and the expectations of the client and the pocketbook of the client. Yeah. So um, it versus your stress. When I ship it that way, I have zero stress. It's just like all they have to do is make sure they're home at the time the guys say they're going to show up. I'm done. Yeah. Um, what about for when you when you make your, <clears throat> you know, away from that custom shipping option, when you've got your crate <clears throat> built, what do you do to pack around the, the piece? What do you use? Do you use a... Uh, Blanket material. Dirty socks. <laughs> um, I, I stick Soul with, diapers. with uh, rigid <laughs> insulation as much as I can yeah. uh, as a barrier between there. You know, lots of bubble wrap. Um, or I think I've used old towels. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, um, you know, try to, try to keep it professional. And if you are shipping anything, factor in the cost of shipping before you when you're quoting the price for the piece because you don't want to come up with a quote thinking it's going to cost you 20 bucks to stick it in the mail and all of a sudden it's costing you 250 bucks and your profit margin just yeah. went away in, in a heartbeat so always you know figure it out guesstimate the size it's easy to go to UPS or even the the post office have they have websites where you plug in the overall dimensions and the weight. And it's actually the dimensions which are going to kill you more than the actual weight of the piece because it's mm -hmm. all about how much volume this is taking up in, in whatever mm -hmm. method that they're they're shipping it. So uh, figure that out. Make sure you, yeah. you quote that because you can get burned. And then, you know, the crating materials are not that expensive. You're probably going to spend maybe 50 bucks there, but it's also going to take you half a day to crate right. that thing out. Uh, so factor that in as well. well. And one other thing I learned, um, not from shipping furniture, but when I was editing the tools and materials department and when I've done tool reviews, there are certain shipments where the the delivery or wherever the piece is being, being delivered, you have to ensure that um, if there's no loading dock, which most people don't have, they have to have a lift gate service. Mm -hmm. And sometimes there's a an ex, there's a more of an expense charge because then the driver actually has to get out and unload for you. So there are different levels yes. of, of service at your door um, yeah, that you'll pay charges for. Or right. Sometimes you have to go to a distribution yeah. facility to pick it up. Exactly. Like a guy like Raleigh Johnson who has a forklift, you know, yes. he can just drive out yes. and meet the UPS guy and <laughs> offload for him. It's It's great. So cool. Good info. Um, let's move on to our second segment. It's time to confess our smooth moves. How come every time I'm on, we do smooth moves? I don't know. <laughs> Coincidence? Yeah. Saw diver. Saw diver. Um, do you want to go first, Mike? Uh, sure. Um, I'll take this way back to the discussion about wood movement. And um, I actually made this mistake more than once. So there were a couple pieces um, that I kept around specifically to remind me of the impact of wood movement. Uh, one piece I was making a humidor. It was actually for a client. Um, it was a walnut dovetailed box with a, um, a bird's eye maple top, which was rabbited into the sides. And I just glued that all the way around because it's small. I mean, it's not like giant and wood doesn't move anyway. So... <laughs> Um, but through the seasons, fortunately, it got returned for other reasons because it was damaged in shipping. So I kept it around. I thought, oh, cool. I have my own humidor. Not that I smoke cigars anymore. But um, when the seasonal changes, you know, I, w I had this box and I felt like, oh, that dovetail is sticking out a little bit. I thought that was – it was really, really flush. So I flushed it back down and then a couple months later – it was like sunken in. It's like, whoa, what? <laughs> and I realized this top was just expanding, contracting, and pushing those sides in and out. And it had completely broken that glue joint of the dovetail. So now I have this sort of breathing dovetail box to remind me wood, wood moves. moves. Yeah. So, and then I had our little kitchen table for a long time was a shaker style table with breadboard ends. And I did elongate the outside peg holes along the breadboard a little bit. Obviously not enough because that actually... Uh, cracked along the top, maybe six inches in from one of the edges of the top. And through the seasons, that thing would like open and close again. You can just watch <laughs> that. Here it comes. Oh, it's gone. Oh, it's gone. It's like, nope, there it came back again. So yeah, wood movement. Um, good lessons learned. <laughs> Fortunately, I'm living with both of those pieces personally and a client isn't being subjected to yeah. that. Yeah. yeah. Do they still pop, make noises for you? Uh, 
No, not to, <laughs> no. They just do their thing now. It's, it's you know those. How do you? How do you? Uh, do you actually have like a formula or something for calculating in wood movement? Because like my table, I'm. I think I left enough of the of of an elongated slot for the screws, and but I'm sitting here going like. I don't know. Maybe in, <laughs> maybe it wasn't maybe, enough. Maybe in a couple of months, I need to get on the floor. And well, you'll, you'll you'll find out come uh, July. Yeah, that's for sure. I think half of it is is sort of elongating the slots, and then depending on the time of year you're building, are you attaching to the inside or the outside of the slot or dead center? I did. I did inside. It's so a way inside. Inside on most of them. There's well, it's I probably got about eighth of an inch to go. On the inside. Oh, that's plenty. And I'd say three eighths of an inch to go on the outside. You'll, you'll never you're fine. You're okay. fine. Yeah, you'll never hit that. You, right. You'll probably start shrinking that as you get used to. Yeah. This you know building here. Well, I mean, I was paranoid, but you know, now I'm. It, was I paranoid enough? No. Now that's a pretty. Your, your tabletop is pretty wide, so it's better. Yeah. Better safe than sorry. Yeah. You so, know, I, and our and our shop can get wonky. I remember when I built my little. Uh, table for for the back porch it was a trestle table and i made the top and i went home for the weekend and i was putting um breadboard ends on and i had the tenons cut and everything um and i came back on monday and, and the, the thing had bowed on oh, me yeah. and i was like oh my god but i was able to kind of muscle it back into into shape i was, yeah. I was fairly paranoid about that and <clears throat> put the stretchers on anytime i was leaving right yeah just to make sure. Yeah, make sure it stays down. How about uh, your smooth move? Well, speaking of my tabletop, <clears throat> um, my smooth move at least was adorable. And <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what to say to that. <laughs> well, so uh, it was it was a Sunday. Uh, I think I was on vacation, but I was I was still in town, and because I don't go anywhere, and uh, you go to the shop on vacation. Yeah. Right? Yeah. <laughs> Well, that's my, my dream vacation. My my wife wanted to weave, and she wanted to some time without me or the child around. So I was like, you know, well, I'll I'll take the boy to the shop, and we'll do something. You know, we um, we pulled the the tabletop out of the clamps, and he thought that was really cool. And then I scraped the glue off, and he thought that was really cool too. And at this point, he's sitting on top of the tabletop, on top of the workbench, and he's just playing. He's got a little truck and he's playing. And so I was like, oh, let me flush it. this. This part's a little high over here. Let me flush this up. I break out a hand plane and I'm making some wood shavings and, and I'm giving him the wood shavings. And he's burying his little truck in the wood shavings. <laughs> I was like, oh, this is awesome. So I set up the camera. I was like, oh, this is Instagram gold. Come on. <laughs> so I'm sitting there hand planing and, and upload it to Instagram. And it was great. And Roz is playing and wants more wood shavings. So I just start making more wood shavings. I'm not really paying attention. And this is the smooth move. If you are hand planing, you really need to pay attention to what you're doing. Oh, okay. You need to, you know, there, there's a lot of signs that the wood is telling you wrong direction or you're, you're, you're screwing up right now. And you need to listen. You need to feel. You need, well, I'm playing and I'm, I'm going cross grain, just flushing stuff up. And I go down to the other end of the board and it just immediately digs in and gouges the top of my tabletop like I'd say a, a sixteenth of an inch. Ouch. That's a good gouge. Yeah. And I was on the fence about taking it to a wide belt sander from the beginning. I was I was thinking I was going to, and it was just immediately it was like, well, <laughs> there that answers that. <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm going next. <laughs> But, uh, yeah, so it was a cute little video, but uh, pay attention when you're hand planing. So is that your first trip to a white belt sander? Yeah. So that's a good thing to happen. Yeah, that was, it, was, it was pretty cool. Good to find the source, yeah. that's for sure. Yep. The local, a local lumberyard, right? Yep, I went to Conway. And uh, they, it, I probably took about 15, 20 minutes. Yeah. Um, got almost all of it. When I got back to the shop, I, I found a little bit more, and it's like, well, that's just going to be a little memory. Were you able to yeah. scrape that out a little bit? I scraped it out. It was there was a little divot, yeah. and it's just going to be there. Right. And I'll think It'll, of my kid see playing on the time. top. You yeah. know, and I I don't see it anymore after okay. it's, the finish is on. But you know, every you, now and then I'll touch it. And you it's know, like, it's there. Where yeah. is it? Where is it? There it is. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> 
I know it's there. Yeah, I know. I, I notice all the mistakes and the pieces I make. It's funny. Oh, well. Well, my smooth move, I was uh, putting my door um, in my cabinet. <clears throat> and again, I'm using a, a solid wood door and wish me luck on that one. But um, I had all the, the hinge mortises done and I was ready to rock and roll. I had the hinge strip installed in the cabinet and um, I was putting the hinges into the door. And so I bought some stainless steel screws so I wouldn't destroy the brass sure. in the during the fitting process. You know, pretty smart advice, I thought. So <laughs> first, first screw that's going in, I'm about three quarters of the way in, and it's not giving me any resistance really, but suddenly it just it just snaps. The whole head just popped off. And I was like, oh, that really stunk. And I think I, I may have said saw diaper a couple times, but the uh, with my smooth bum, bum, moves, bum. you know, they're never it's never once. I've I've got to do it again. So I thought, okay, I can I can get that one out, I think. Let me let me put this other one in because I'm just fitting. I can I can do it with two screws in here. And um, same thing. I figure okay, I'll pull back. Maybe my pilot hole is a little bit too too narrow or whatever. And um, same darn thing happens in the second hole. Snaps right out. And by then, saw diaper was like all caps. <laughs> but I so I, I pull I pull the hinge out and I'm thinking, oh, this really stinks. And I thought, well, maybe I can I can back it out. So I took my a narrow chisel and I kind of went around the first one around the edge, thinking I could grab my my electrician's needle nose pliers in there, grab it and back it out. And it worked. I was super psyched. I mean, the I, I still have to, I'm still going to have to drill it out and probably put a patch in there. So I'm like, oh, it wasn't as bad as I thought. So I go to the second one trying to do the same thing. And the first turn backing it out with the needle nose pliers, the thing breaks again. And so now it's broken, you know, about an eighth of an inch inside the, the door. And that's when all bets were off. So I had to dig it all out and then put another patch in. And I'm just like... Again, my uh, I think the smooth move, the thing that makes it a smooth move more than anything is the fact that I don't learn the first time I make a mistake, <laughs> and I I think well maybe that was just the that first was a fluke. time yeah. it was a fluke and boom. <laughs> so uh, I mean I basically I went back and and redrilled the pile of holes a little bit more. And, like Mike gave me some advice about you know driving the screws and the hinges, and you know his he was saying if you feel any resistance, back it out. And so when I felt resistance, not only did I back it out, but I felt like I needed a little bit more of a, a deeper pilot hole. But that's what I that's how I fixed it. The confusing thing for me about this is I always thought that stainless steel was stronger than steel. Right. But and I'm sure somebody will comment. It, Maybe the sheer strength of stainless steel. It's steels? not. It's it's relatively soft. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the sheer strength of stainless is not very good. No. So you want to use because everyone always says use a steel screw. Right. Yeah. So, hmm. so don't use stainless. Right. Well, I I I would have thought that you were you know <clears throat> hedging your bets with the stainless, but I guess not. Well, I learned my lesson. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> for now. And now at least I know that a needle nose plier can sometimes work to back out a screw that's broken. But you, Mike, had, you'd said you have a tool for that. Yeah. Yeah. Tom, you're the editor of Fine Woodworking Magazine, correct? <laughs> I am. Okay. So you read every single article written in the magazine. I do. Okay. I wrote a tool review a while back by the most awesome product in the world called, I think they're called Unscrewums, um, where it's just a little split pin. Uh, with sort of a saw profile uh, filed into one end, the reverse way. So you stick it in your, your uh, chuck it in your drill, you turn your drill on reverse so the, the teeth are now going in the right direction. Right, right in there, and these teeth, they, they sort of cut around, they basically cut a little post on the end of the broken screw way down inside there until the ring expands enough and there's enough friction, then instead of cutting, it starts to screw, basically unscrew the broken screw exactly out of there. It is perfect. It's, and that's, can, you, can you put that in my inbox, Ben? I'm, <laughs> I had these, actually... These, these were I, at, at, the, at Bob's. Yes. Yeah. And it's it's a guy, and he makes them, and so I have to get him because uh, I, I it's not the first time I busted a screw. You've talked about it on the podcast before. I too. have, and I feel really bad because I was thinking over the holiday season, wouldn't it be nice just to get a little something to like everyone on the staff? And I thought that'd be cool to give everyone a little unscrew them, a little screw, unscrew. Thing. <laughs> 
because you know, you, Tom gave that could help me. Something, right? <laughs> that I could know, help but me. Then, <laughs> then I felt really bad. So yeah, <laughs> I may have to borrow it. I'm uh, still, you know, hanging the door. Well, it's already hung. I just need to when I have to take it off now to finish it and whatnot. But I have on occasion found myself epoxying a little you, brass screw head. I remember that was this on the podcast. <laughs> well, I, I remember that's something I remember because I was thinking when I broke the one, I was like, well, maybe I don't have to repair that one. I'll just do what Mike yeah. does and I'll, you know, super glue something yes. in there and, and make believe. But when once I broke the second, all bets were off. And yeah. It's time and I'm to, just it's super time to patch. The whole hinge on and <laughs> just, there's no going to be a door this time. Forget it. So um, <laughs> well, let's move on to uh, some questions as we're running a little bit late, I think. This oh, one good. comes from Barry, and Barry says, I'm building a set of cabinets that will have a total of 16 drawers. I'm looking at using Baltic Birch for the material, and I would like to use a lock rabbit joint for ease in production, but I have a concern over the short grain in the joint. Is it an issue? No. Next question. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> we, I use that joint anytime in the shop or what if I do big built-in installs, lots of drawers. I did it for my kitchen. I've done it for some other jobs as well. Use a quarter-inch dado blade in your saw. You cut a little uh, dado along the edge of the drawer front and the drawer back, and it does create a little bit of short grain. Um, I've never had it break out, and a lot of times, especially in that situation, and then you cut a little rabbit along the edge of your drawer front and back that fits into that groove. Um, and I'll just, when I'm putting those together, I'll glue them up, uh, put them together, and I'll just use a little 18-gauge uh, pin nailer and pop it through the joint to sort of clamp it. Um, and I've never had anything fail. It's a really, it's, it's a bomb-proof It's a good joint. I, I, I built two hanging cabinets for um, for a friend of mine, and I used the lock rabbit for the case. Yeah. And it was super easy to set up. And I think I, I, think I learned how to do it from Chris Gochner, and I think it was during a photo shoot he was doing... Um, I can't remember what the project would be. He was cutting a lock rabbit, and he was really smart in how he set up and cranked him out. I mean, I, I've done this for drawers, and I've had the same <clears> thought, though. It's like, man, that's that's a lot of weight getting pulled on that little piece of plywood. And if you're using Baltic birch, which Baltic birch is very, very high-quality plywood. Yes. Um, you don't need to worry about it nearly as much as big box store, whatever. You know, there is some plywood out there that, I think would be questionable with a lock rabbit joint. Baltic birch, I'm, yeah. I'm not going to worry about it. Yeah, I don't think I'd worry about it. And the bottoms, be because they're plywood, and there's no, and I'm using a plywood bottom. I'm always gluing and nailing the plywood bottom on as well. Mm. So there's a little bit tip. more strength there. And here's the the cool thing. Let's say you have a stack of drawers that are all the same dimension. Um, on top of each other, they can be different heights, but as long as the same width and depth are the same. I will run that joinery on a big piece of plywood before ripping it into That's individual smart. drawers. And then I'm just like, man, I'm production right here. <laughs> That's yeah. great. So. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a, it, like Mike says, it's bomb proof. Um, <clears throat> we have time for one last question. This was from Brad from Burbank. And he says, great article in the November, December issue, Essential Clamp Kit. That was by Jeff Miller. He says, I'd like to get some heavy-duty I-beam clamps, but I can't find a manufacturer. Any suggestions? And nope. It's unfortunate that that I-beam maker, was it York Jorgensen, is no yeah. longer in business. But if you go to woodworking events or shows or flea markets, you might find some. Or just keep an eye out for um, one place to find them is probably if you see a, a – a, a closing sale or a, a clearance sale for a woodworking shop or is a woodworking manufacturer that's closing up is a good place to uh, to see if you can dig them up. Craigslist. I mean, every every time, I, it's funny. I always expect to go on Craigslist and type in clamps and see some huge pile of clamps for like. 30 bucks. No. Yeah, no. No. No, they're expensive. I mean, especially... And people the, know it. It's yeah. That they're, they're high, internet. They're high value. I mean, you can't really go cheap on, on clamps, even buying them used. I mean, I went... I bought a... There was a recently a woodworker, unfortunately, it's a sad story. He had he had passed away and his family was selling everything in his shop. And I bought bought some stuff there, some mostly lumber. 
but I bought a handful of clamps and, you know, these kids knew the value of these things and they weren't going down. So I was yeah. like, well, it's yeah. still cheaper than buying them uh, at Woodcraft or, or wherever at a store. So if I had a really good source, I probably wouldn't say what it was. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's true. Um, but in terms of alternatives to that, I think pipe clamps are a really good low cost solution mm -hmm. for doing yeah. that. And um, I also have become a recent convert to those aluminum style bar clamps, which I used to think were too light and flexible, but um, I, I like them quite a bit. And one of the knocks on those styles of clamps versus the really heavy I-beam is that there's a little more flex in the bar. But as long as you're alternating the clamps, you know, top and bottom, if you're gluing up a panel, it's pretty easy to get around that. I don't yeah. find that to be a hindrance. Whereas those I, the, the true Jorgensen I-beam clamps, they are so freaking heavy. Mm-hmm that you have to apply, if you're doing a case glue up, you have to apply so much pressure just to keep the clamp from like twisting or falling <laughs> off that it's usually more clamping pressure than I want. So in a lot of cases, I don't even think that's the best solution. So I don't think it's an issue of, well, that's the best, but here's some alternatives. I think in a lot of cases, a pipe clamp or the, the lighter weight aluminum bar clamp is probably a better solution. Yeah, I mean, for, uh, I'm sorry. For um, what well, Mike was talking about using those lightweight aluminum clamps, I mean, the the truth is, you don't really have to. You shouldn't be grilling down on yeah. your clamp on your panel glue ups. You shouldn't have to, you know, go bonkers and trying to get this thing so tight that you're denting the wood. I the fine woodworking shop. I like to. I love it. But sometimes the clamps down there are a <laughs> little less than satisfying yes. to work with. What do you mean? <laughs> it's it's like it's like the lost village of 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 clamps that really should be thrown away. Yes. And um, who is this guy? The <laughs> the aluminum clamps down there, which I'm a fan of them too, because it's the only thing I can afford at home. Um, it's like somebody has cranked them down too That's hard. What I mean. Yeah. Yeah. And but it isn't a matter of the bar bending; it's a matter of the head digging in. Oh, it, it like it, it racked because and gets you, and digs oh, so, in, and, then it, and there's little notches oh. now worn into the aluminum. And the problem is, you you, you tighten it up, tighten it up, and you go to move something, and it won't loosen now. Oh, right. And I've gone crazy trying to sand those ridges off. I've huh. waxed them. I've, and it's like as soon as they go over that, that yeah, just they around that clamp. corner, just, yeah. just move on, I, right. I think. Um, but we've got a few down there with, you know, big MDF pads glued to them. And they're, those are my favorite clamps in the whole shop, I think. Hmm. We've got tons of parallel clamps, but they're all pretty rough too. But yeah. Hmm. They've seen a few too many workbench builds. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll... Uh talk to the manager about that <laughs> <laughs> that's all we have uh time for this episode of shop talk live tune in again in two weeks for our next episode remember to send your questions and comments to shop talk at taunton.com and please spread the word about shop talk live to your woodworking friends and neighbors you can catch the podcast via itunes stream it on the web at shoptalklive.com or catch us on iHeartRadio. Finally, you can keep up with Fine Woodworking on Instagram and on Facebook and look for all of us on Instagram as well. Thanks for listening and have fun in the shop. That was great without Matt. <laughs> I mean, I miss him. <laughs> Where is he? San Diego. Which, of course, in German means a whale's saw diaper. <laughs>